Hello, I'm Chuck Martin, and welcome to the Voices of the Internet of Things. With me today is Brady Watkins, Senior Vice President and General Manager of SoftBank Robotics America. Brady has been Head of Commercial Automation and Head of Revenue at SoftBank Robotics, Vice President of Digital Client Solutions at Interworkings, and Director of Sales Planning and Integration at Ubisoft. In his current role at SoftBank Robotics, Brady focuses on autonomous services to commercial management in sectors including real estate, transportation, and retail. Brady works across development, engineering, marketing, and customer success on strategic robotic solutions. Welcome here, Brady. Thank you, Chuck. Glad to be here. Appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. So tell me, how did you get to SoftBank before we start? How did you get to SoftBank Robotics before we get going here? Oh, what a great journey. Uh, well, first and foremost, I love, I've always loved robotics. And I really love robotics in the idea of what it represented as a commercial problem. So I've, I've always wanted to be in business and really try to solve um, commercial challenges that were at the intersection of software, hardware, and technology as a mission. And you sort of talked about it with video games. It started there as really this ultimate um, conversion of hardware, software, and storytelling through Ubisoft and video games really gave me an appreciation for how, how all these technologies in an industry can really create meaningful value. And had a great run there, met lots of great people in the industry, and then started to explore out where else could that passion and um, opportunity lie. Robotics was always a personal uh, opportunity and favorite for me. Um, and so I looked across the industry and said, where's the next area of where we can apply the combination of hardware and software for commercial value? And robotics seemed like the perfect place. Um, and looking across who's an industry leader and really trying to attack both a short term and a long term problem, SoftBank in general and specifically SoftBank Robotics really fit the bill, uh, made the jump and never looked back and just love what the industry and the opportunity is not only current, but in the future. So when you joined SoftBank, that was a few years ago, right? Yes. Uh, where, what was the state of robotics then versus sort of where it is today? I, it's a, the state of robotics then and today. I think even as we answer that, like robotics has been around for over 100 years. And I think you know this, Chuck. So I, we were, this isn't the first time robots were around. But I think what has evolved is really the integration of technology. And I think for Internet of Things is that technology has emerged. So even four years ago when we started, the advent of Siri or Alexa or voice recognition was still nascent and so maybe non-existent. So I think the proliferation of other technologies in and around robotics have really evolved, which I think has allowed robotics to move into other industries where it otherwise um, hadn't been prevalent. And even specific today, some of the things we're talking about, even in the pandemic world, things like cleaning and how robotics can really help solve some of those challenges. So I really see it as the evolution of the ecosystem and allowing robotics to be able to explore how to create more value in other industries that you wouldn't necessarily expect um, four years ago, but are looking at sort of watershed transformation as we go forward. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Pepper. Um, I saw Pepper back in 2017. I think you were probably there as well at CES in these private showings. And Pepper seems to be the first of the, what I consider a, a potential mainstream robotic thing. Um, can you talk about Pepper? I'm not sure everyone knows what Pepper is, but uh, unless they've seen it at a Microsoft booth or somewhere, but if you could talk about Pepper and its history and where it, where it is now. Mm -hmm. What well, so Pepper's a really great story. So Pepper is a humanoid robot. And in understanding sort of where Pepper came to be, you probably have to understand where SoftBank Robotics mission is. And one of our core values is, is really how do we create meaningful value for humankind using robotics, automation, and technology? And one of the first problems in that mission that we wanted to tackle is how do we create meaningful value of interaction and conversation in a commercial lens? So Pepper was designed to really create a human interaction and establish value in the commercial setting of how do we really create an interaction with the customer to drive them to value, specifically around banking and retail. So really solving a juicy and meaty problem of how do we leverage autonomous robotics and humanoid robotics to solve a business problem uh, in market. 
So where did where did Pepper work? I mean, Pepper has been at, at airports, at at, uh, at at shopping malls, and stores. And I'm not seeing Pepper all over the place. Where where is the sweet spot? Do you do you have one yet? I think you mentioned all of them. So you hit the nail on the head. So retail, commercial banking is obviously a sweet spot, and really anywhere where you've got a sort of customer service interaction that you can provide. Um, a meaningful task to be able to create an interaction with the person and then drive them to a higher value situation. So in a banking format, it's being able to create that first interaction where you can maybe, where you can address uh, the guest, being able to understand an initial problem or solution and then pass them off either to, if it's a teller or a digital solution. So really think about retail and banking, that omni-channel um, technology linkage that's where it performs really well. So as we think about anywhere where you have those problems, creating a human interaction, humanoid interaction, and passing off to the further customer journey is where we're seeing extreme value. You must have a lot of research by now because there have been so many customer interactions with Pepper. What, what do people typically do with the, the humanoid robot? Do they get scared? No, I, and that's a good question. They don't get scared, and I think really, um, from a social interaction, people trust technology almost more so than they do the human interaction. So what humanoid robots and Pepper, and I wouldn't even say some of the other robotics that we have do a really good job of is allowing for an information exchange through the customer journey more so than humans um, on occasion. So we're able to address the interaction. You're able to get um, specific questions and answers and then push them back to the rest of the journey. Often when you walk up to a person, the first thing you ask them, right, we've all been there is, um, uh, hey, can I help you? And the first answer usually is no. But with a piece of technology, hey, can I help you? Yes, I am looking for X, Y, and Z. And so you've already created um, that path to where you ever want the customer to go to be able to help provide meaningful value. So I think it's one of the places where we're seeing robotics really create and establish higher value in, in the customer journey for retail. Um, with some of our old robot products as well, we're actually seeing meaningful value and expansion there as well. Is that because the robot is not judging the person as opposed to a, a person judging a person? I mean, do they have that feeling of this is an unbiased piece of technology? Yeah, I think it, it's back to confidence and trust. I'm trusting that the technology isn't there to sell me. The technology is there to help me. So therefore, I'm more willing to provide information that helps me get to the result I'm looking for, which is assistance or help. And I think that's really important in a lot of different areas of creating confidence um, using robotics to create confidence in whether it's the customer journey, or I think some of the other things, creating confidence that you are providing value um, in retail, in hospitality, in other areas, even cleaning, which I think is really relevant in this pandemic that we're currently uh, in. Yeah, so with, with companies, with uh, products like, like Pepper, uh, in terms of where they go, are they different in different markets? I, I know in Asia, it's been different than the US and SoftBank is obviously extremely global. Can you talk about the different reactions to consumers in different marketplaces? I think consumer, you know what, and you look at the business problem, I think consumer reactions are all similar in that the problem is I wanna create and delight my customers, um, my employees, or my clients to be able to provide better value for them. So where can robotics fit into that ecosystem? So I think we're seeing Pepper have the same result in the ecosystem of being able to really uh, absorb people in that first interaction and then push them through the journey. Obviously there are always cultural challenges, but that's what's great about technology uh, robotics is that we're able to insert ourselves into the process and then be able to push that back into other groups. So across the globe, we're actually seeing similar usage, just different uh, communication and sort of cultural um, nuances that you would expect for any, you know, retail experience, hotel experience. But the goal and mission is really the same in the value. So are robotics primarily right now a, a, a B2B play where a business is going to use robotics to serve its, its customers? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I think that's where you're going to see, particularly with the pandemic, and the focus on what does the new normal look like in businesses, uh, you're gonna continue to see a reevaluation of what does, how do we create confidence in the marketplace to be able to bring people back into our public spaces? And that creating that confidence and value um, really takes a step back, back and lets you ask, what tools do I have at my disposal to create that confidence? And this is a challenge that robotics and automation and technology has really been focused on solving. 
So as we look at where robotics continues to grow and play, B2B continues to be an epicenter in my mind of growth based on what we're seeing even before the pandemic, but even more so post pandemic. So what, what about home robotics? Is that going to happen? I think history has already solved the home robotics scenario um, with what we're seeing. I think what we haven't necessarily solved with the pandemic is how do we leverage and address the public space arena in terms of understanding where our investment can create that confidence. Because um, we know the new normal is here in terms of the pandemic and the questions of how do we make sure that we're utilizing technology to help us create a more confident environment where we feel safe, um, where we feel like we can continue to go leverage all the public spaces and what that looks like for businesses. So what's the tough part? Is it hardware or software? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I, that's very cliched and say it's a good question. I don't think the tough, the tough part isn't hardware or software. I think the opportunity is the integration within the larger ecosystem. Uh, I think we've, you know, hardware and software integration is already there. I think it's more so how do we make sure we solve the use case and value proposition, really focusing on the problem. So if we understand the problem or the opportunity, very often robotics, automation, and technology have been able to seamlessly help provide value. So it's really about making sure we have the right use case first, and then hardware, software, and technology find their way to integrate. And we have a really good ecosystem um, in an IoT format in my mind to make that happen. So where does the software happen? I remember when Pepper was first created, it was like Pepper was really essentially a platform. And then mm -hmm. people had to essentially adapt the platform to their particular use case, whatever their, their business was. Where does that happen now? Does, does SoftBank do it? Does somebody else do it? The real answer is it depends. And I think where I would shift the conversation of platform is it's more about how do you integrate? So the question that we often answer is how do we take something like Pepper or in different industries and other robotics like Wiz, or you can see other robotic opportunities. It's really about how do we integrate into the current ecosystem that exists. So in a building or a public space, how do we make sure that we're seamlessly integrating to what's already there? And how do we do that usually around what data and what information we can provide is really the focus. So I move away from the word platform and more into an integration opportunity. And I think that's where things get really exciting, particularly around IoT and AI and sort of connected devices. Oh, fair enough. Uh, can you talk about Wiz? You mentioned Wiz. Is, is that primarily for commercial spaces? Yes. So uh, Wiz is our commercial robotic vacuum. Uh, specifically, its goal is to create value and efficiency within the cleaning industry, uh, which is fascinating because you wouldn't think why cleaning, but cleaning is actually one of the largest and longstanding industries in the world that you wouldn't necessarily think about, um, but a really great opportunity more so with the pandemic uh, of where technology and automation can really create value and sort of create, have this watershed moment in that industry, given what we're seeing with the pandemic. So is this a, is Wiz a big unit? No. So think uh, R2-D2 in terms of size, best way I can describe it. It just goes up and down the aisles and cleans? Yes. So it goes up and down. So it's, uh, we have a teach and repeat model. So think of the size of R2-D2. Um, what you do is a worker would be, would map the area. So you effectively map um, the route that you would want to vacuum. Uh, and then automation takes over, you press a button, and then it follows that same route to provide a consistent, frequent clean. So why, why that not the, the home space? I think I know the answer, but I want to hear you say it. I think history's already solved the home. And the opportunity really in the public space was where we see the highest value and return. And when you look at the cleaning industry and just in terms of the total building size and the consist consistency out, to, out there, there was really an opportunity in terms of size and scale um, that was untapped and was an area for us to go tackle. So what about some failures in the space? Not necessarily uh, with SoftBank, but you've got companies like, like Walmart had, they had inventory, automatic robotic inventory tracking, and they just said, we're, in, re in regards to the pandemic, we're going to scrap that since we've got the people anyway, so we don't need the technology. Are you seeing any of that anywhere? And it's a good, I can't speak to Bossanova and inventory management, but I think what we found is successful is when you design around solving a need and understanding where there's a new need. So what I see is where successes are is finding the investment. And today what we're seeing is there's a huge investment in understanding how to create, how to define the new public space and make it safe and make it accessible for people uh, 
in the new normal pandemic. And when you think about that design and understanding how do we move to a more continuous confirmation, um, when you design things around how do we do continuous confirmation, continuous clean, continuous information um, that wasn't there prior, that's very often where technology automation and robotics have been successful for the past hundred years. So I think it's really about designing around a use case and a problem allows you to create success. So where, and that's really how we think about it and focus. So where is all this going? That's a good question. I, I think what the pandemic has showed us is is it's a watershed moment for transition in robotics and automation. And when we look at these public spaces, these are huge opportunities, I think, for the integration of technology and IoT. You're now looking at uh, building spaces where um, maybe we net there, we have to have a confirmed um, safety environment. So before, when you walked into a building, maybe you wanted it to be safe. You didn't need it to be safe. But now with the pandemic, what we're seeing is this need and shift that I have to have a place that feels safe. Um, and then we look at the business response to that. How do we create confirmation and confidence that it's there? And so I'm seeing a huge investment from a lot of companies in terms of making sure that their employees, their clients, or their customers feel safe. And what I really love about that conversation is when you start to invest in confirmation, you're investing in frequency, you're investing in information sharing, and you're having to invest in integration. And those are all places where robotics, automation, technology, AI, hunt for and see. And so I'm really excited. Um, I think not excited is probably the wrong word, but we're encouraged by that opportunity and investment in bringing back a safe work environment. Um, from the pandemic. So I think we're going to see that be a watershed moment that changes and creates some opportunities in the IoT space. So has the pandemic caused people, some, some businesses to come to you and say, hey, we need some of this stuff now. We didn't need it before, but we really need it now. I, I can tell you there's been unprecedented demand in robotics overall and specifically in the question of, and I think it's back to that, I think I wanted this before, this solution, but now I need it. So I don't want to say it wasn't there, but it accelerated the, the need to view and understand how do I think about technology helping me solve this problem that was always there, which is clean hygiene, creating a safer space in public buildings. But now more so I have to do it now. So let's accelerate that discussion, uh, which is exciting. And do you deal with, with heavy duty things like factories and that sort, is that, th that sort of robotics or not? We don't specifically deal with factories uh, as it plays into cleaning. But as we look at the overall trends, we're hearing similar examples of how to solve that problem. How do we take tasks to create efficiency and some sister partners across uh, not only the SoftBank portfolio, but also just as friends of the industry, really hearing the same, hearing the same things is the question of how do I create efficiency? How do I use technology? to create a frequency of tasks? How do I integrate into my existing ecosystem, make it more efficient? Those conversations I'm hearing a lot more than before, um, which is only going to help not only the it, for us, the industry, but I think really create value uh, going forward. At this time, can the current robotics industry handle the demand? Oh, I, I think the robotics industry has been prepared to handle the demand for uh, a long time. I think this is more about moving from um, from a, uh, let's call it an industrial now into a customer facing. So I think what you're seeing is robotics moving in and around people um, and being able to create value, which is really exciting. So I think we've been around in the industrial demand to be able to scale correctly. Now we're just moving into new industries, sectors, and interaction points with the customer. So I think it's just merely an evolution um, preparedness, the, your, the industry has always been prepared. It's just a matter of continuing to evolve our use case into new areas that maybe it weren't relevant or visible. Yeah, you made a good point earlier that, that robotics have been around forever. It's just that they're not kind of explosive now for, for these various reasons you mentioned. Um, in terms of consumers, are, are there any times where consumers are going to be starting to deal with robotics directly or is it going to come from another a B2B play essentially where a, a company is serving them using robotics? I think in our everyday lives as consumers, you know, when we look at where what we travel in our everyday lives, you know, 90% of our time is actually spent indoors, believe it or not, indoors in your home, but indoors in a 
restaurant or in an office, or at least that's where it was. And we know it's going to get back to that. So consumers are going to be interacting with robots in their daily lives as we continue to expand. And I think the focus for us is where you're going to see that evolution is more in those, we call them public spaces, but whether it's in the hotel, whether it's in the airport, uh, whether it's in a hospital or whether it's in what a, a newly reimagined office space looks like, um, you're going to see the interaction with robotics go up based on the investment that companies are making to make sure that it's a better experience and a safer experience given the pandemic. So what are humanoid robots like Pepper going to look like in a few years? The looks, you're going to see very similar looks. I think you're going to see higher horsepower and modularization and better integration within the ecosystem. So the looks are very important because that creates the interaction. So the look is based off about 10 to 15 years of science to make sure it creates an interaction. So I think you're going to see looks um, maintain the test of time. But I think but what you're going to see is more adoption and integration into the customer journey, into the integration, and more connected into things like cloud native environments, you know, more IoT integration. So I think it's more of just integration and orchestration of the ecosystem. And the, in terms of artificial intelligence in this, is that just growing exponentially? I, I, yes, the market from AI perspective, we know AI is hot right now and always has been in terms of the marketplace. Uh, what I like is robotics is creating a practical application within new industries that is allowing AI to be visual. So we're leveraging artificial intelligence when a commercial robotic vacuum is uh, moving around an office space. That's creating data. That data can interplay with an HVAC system that now has smart center sensors that can integrate into an overall smart building concept. So you're starting to see practical um, combined with theoretical and robotics being at the center of it, which is what makes this really exciting. So lastly, what advice would you give a business that hasn't really done anything with robotics yet, but, but you know they really should be? I think lean in and uh, make the investment in what your customer or client experience needs to be. So if you are investing in making sure your clients are having a maximum experience, know that robotics is a practical way to create value where maybe you wouldn't think. So I, my advice would be the tools of robotics are there and they can be a part of your ecosystem. So if you're a CTO, expanding robotics for practical application can help you with your IoT strategy. It's there and the ecosystem exists and partners are ready to help you. If you're looking to create a safer environment for the pandemic, there are robotics out there that can seamlessly integrate on day one to help you be successful on investing to your clients. So I think overall robots are here to help create value for you today. And they're extremely modular to make sure they can help you in the future. And that's what makes this so exciting. Great stuff. Thank you, Brady Watkins. And thank you all for listening to the voices of the Internet of Things. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate the time.